Yes. Uh, it's Lithuan no, no, yeah. uh, Just a quick one. Um, if I donate 50,000 um, from my estate, um, so when I die, please donate 50,000 to so and so. How do I account for it in the LND account? Is it an expense or? So uh, donations that you give out to someone is obviously has tax implications. Yes. Look at donate. Um, when it comes to donations, it uh, it does then come out as a um, it doesn't come out as a liability. It will yeah. find a home under estate duty, um, and uh, will also come into play in the distribution account. So I wouldn't show it in the liquidation account. I would show it in the distribution account. Or oh, in the distribution account. Oh, okay. No, it makes sense. Perfect. Cool. All right. That is it, Jens. Just hold on one second. We, we, I just want to mention we, we can't start a process where we just start asking questions uh, randomly. And uh, it's not, I'm not trying to be funny or anything. I'm just doing this because it, it's going to stop the whole process going forward. So I think let, let's keep the questions for during that time period. I know there's someone else who wanted to ask a question now. If you can just give me your name quickly, sir. Uh, Jonathan. Jonathan, good. Jonathan, you'll be the first one who can ask me a question when we open up for questions now. Now, And yeah, just we're just doing it this way. Otherwise, we can't make progress and we, we are limited with time, ladies and gents. All right. So we've done the liquidation account. Um, the next account we said we need to have a look at is the estate duty account. Now, ladies and gents, keep in mind, we have to now do this account so that we can get the answer and fill it into our liquidation account. So look on top of the paper there. You'll see I gave you a formula. The formula is property plus deemed property less, ladies and gents, when you see the word less, it just means minus. Section 4, allowable deductions, minus Section 4A, primary rebate. You'll see I put in brackets 3.5 million. Ladies and gents, this is not a figure that varies. That is just study work. Remember, the current primary rebate in South Africa is 3.5 million. So property plus deemed property, less Section 4, allowable deductions, less your uh, 3.5 million primary rebate gives you an answer. That answer we call a dutable amount. 20% of that answer we call estate duty. So we want to get to this estate duty calculation. Now, keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, for those who might be a bit lost, estate duty is bad. I can't say it in a more layman's term. So we want to try and do estate planning in a way that we don't have to pay estate duty. Because if we have to pay estate duty, remember, we're minusing it from our assets and our liquidation account. It means there's going to be left less money left to distribute for our marriage, our legacies, and our heirs, all right? So property plus deemed property, we would like to keep as low as possible because we are adding those two figures. Allow deductions and the primary rebate are things we are minusing, so this is good. But you can see straight away, if you got property plus deemed property minus allow deductions, whatever answer you have there, we have to minus three and a half million from it. So if your property plus team property less allow deductions, it's less than three and a half minute, uh, million. We already know our dutable amount is going to be a negative answer. Now you don't get a negative answer in estate duty. You get nil. 20% of nil remains nil. Okay. So if we deal with property and the rules say we can potentially minus something from it, this is good. All right. The more allow deductions we have, this is good, right? Because like I say, we don't want a high figure because any figure or any answer above zero means we have to pay that amount in terms of estate duty. So let's look how we practically enforce that. So if you look at that formula, the only things that we need to figure out what is what is what is property, what is deemed property, and what is allowable deductions. Because after that, the rest of the equation speaks for itself. From there, you minus three and a half million, get an answer. 20% of that is your estate duty. So it's those first three things or first three parts of the formula that we are quite interested in knowing. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I could easily just tell you, go look in your book, 
what is property, what is deep property, what is allowable deductions. Then you can do estate duty. But I've sort of made a, a fake or a fabricated estate duty account down just to illustrate to you, well, you know, in my personal opinion, what you are likely to come across going forward. And for exam purposes as well, keeping in mind that these notes over here in front of you doesn't perhaps paint the full picture, but it paints a good enough picture that we're able to understand what our books is talking about. Okay, so the first part of the equation of the estate duty addendum or estate duty account is property. So you'll see I put the heading property. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we need to determine what is property. Very easy. Property is your total assets. Where do I get my total assets from? From my liquidation account. So I go have a look at my liquidation account. What was my total asset? And I put it down in the positive column. All right. But you can see there under total assets, I say less 30% of a farming undertaking or less difference in private company shares. So I need you guys to make your notes as we go along. I'm saying there is potentially two things we can minus from our total assets. So in other words, the law is saying we'll give you a break on these two things. We won't hit you um, in, in terms of tax of those two things. So the first potential thing is you can minus 30% of a farming undertaking. So let's just understand what is a farming undertaking. This is not just a farm where people live at. This is a place where people live and farm. So it's used for residential and commercial purposes. So for example, in our liquidation account, we had that Earth 678. I could have easily told you that Earth 678 was a farming undertaking or bona fide farming undertaking. That is still immovable property. And I would have recorded it in the same way in my liquidation account. But what they are saying is that if it's a farming undertaking, we won't tax you, we won't um, tax you on the full amount. You can get a 30% deduction. So let's say it was 2 million, our Earth 678, and I told you in the exam, it's a farming undertaking. Okay. I would have put my 2 million in my liquidation accounts under immovables by assets, meaning it would have formed part of my total assets. But they are saying, go to that farm that's valued at 2 million, minus 30% from it. Now, 30% of 2 million is about 600,000 Rand. Meaning we could minus then 600,000 rand because you will not be hit on 30% of the value of the farming undertaking. So that's an exception to the rule. This is actually a grace they are giving you. So you know if you own a farming undertaking, you won't be taxed off you down the whole amount. 30% of it is sort of excluded, which is positive for us. If you look at the second option, it says less difference in private company shares. Now, let me just explain that for a moment. First of all, I'm referring to private companies, PTY, LTDs, not to public companies. Okay. It says difference in private company shares. You can make a note there for me. This is when private company shares are sold for more than what they are valued at. This is when private company shares are sold for more than what they are valued at. So let us say in the exam, let's go back to our liquidation account. You remember we had ABC company. Uh, that was a private company we had, and we said they realized. Okay, realized means the shares were sold. Excellent. So let us say the exam question said, you had shares in ABC PTY Limited. They were valued at 200,000 Rand, but they were sold for 250,000 Rand. Now we think, okay, those shares were sold for 50,000 Rand more than what they were valued at. If you recall in our liquidation account, we placed the sold for figure in, all right? So we put the 250,000 Rand down. But what they are saying is we're not going to tax you on the full 250,000 Rand because they were only valued at 200,000 Rand. The difference between what they were valued at and what they were sold for, we will exclude. So if they were valued at 200K but sold for 250K, that 50,000 rand difference, we can minus over here. But I want you to keep in mind, this is only when the private company shares are sold for more than what they were valued at. If they were valued at 200, but sold for 180, I would have put 180 in my liquidation account. I would have said nothing about it in my estate duty account. 
because they weren't sold for more than what they were valued at. If the question simply said the shares were just valued at 200,000 Rand, we understand then we had to award it. Again, I would have not have used it in our estate duty account, right? So it's only when shares are sold for more than what they were valued at. So I can just assume in the exam, they would probably either give you a farming undertaking or probably more likely a private company where they say shares were sold for more than what they were valued at. Because they want to understand you take the difference between the valued for and sold for figure and we minus it from our total assets. Okay. Again, it is positive for us if we minus things. So we took our total asset figure from uh, our uh, liquidation account and minus potentially those two things. That gave us our property value. Now, ladies and gents, you could perhaps not have got a farming undertaking in the exam. You could perhaps not have got a private company in the exam. If you don't get any of it, then we just stick to total assets, eh? Because then there's nothing to minus from it. Okay. You get your property figure. The second step that we need to calculate is what is deemed property. If you have a look, we then go plus deemed property. And I mentioned three potential forms of deemed property to look out for. Now, first of all, if someone donates, let's say, 100,000 Rand to your estate, we must keep in mind, if someone donates money to your estate, we don't regard it as an asset. But for purposes of estate duty, any donations made into the deceased estate will be taxable. So we must plus it. Right. So that is a potential deemed property. Secondly, do you see the accrual claim received? Now, we need to keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, when we hear the word accrual, that is a marriage regime. Hey? That is when you're married out of community of property with the accrual system. And we spoke about it last night and we said, remember, if you're married with the accrual system, when you pass away, the marriage is terminated. Then they have a look how much each spouse grew during the course of their marriage, and they make sure we split the money equally. So the deceased might owe the surviving spouse money because of the marriage, or the other way around. The surviving spouse might owe the deceased money because of the accrual system. So what they are saying is if you pass away and they do the accrual calculation, and they see, okay, your surviving spouse, let's say, owes the deceased estate 200,000 rand because of the marriage regime. They are saying that money they owed you because of the marriage regime was not an asset in our liquidation account. But for purposes of estate duty, we're going to count it as an asset. So any accrual that the deceased estate is entitled to is regarded as deemed property. And then the third one, which I believe is probably the most likely scenario. Life policies with named beneficiary. Let's go back to the liquidation account. If you recall our discussion over policies, I said, when you have a life policy that has a named beneficiary, we do not include it in our liquidation account because it's not our asset. But look over here. It has a home under deemed property. Now, this is where estate duty comes back and bites people. For the simple reason, you might have a small estate. Well, not that small. Let's say you have a, an estate worth $2 million, for argument's sake. But you have a life policy that says when you die, your children must be paid out $5 million. All of a sudden, you don't have a $2 million total asset for tax purposes. You have a $7 million asset because that life policy with the name beneficiary is plus. It's regarded as property deemed to be property. Right. So this is where estate planning comes in. It's probably, you know, not too clever in terms of estate duty purposes to create a life policy that um, is paid out to someone else unless that person is your spouse. And we'll see now now why. OK, so I, I, I would assume that's a likely question for the simple reason that they would want to see that that life policy you did not include in your liquidation account, but you included it under deemed property in your estate duty. So you add that up, okay? Again, you might have only got one of those three things. Then we just do the one that we got in the exam. We're just talking about different possibilities. So we have property plus deemed property. What's our next step? Our next step is to minus section four allowable deductions. Yeah, I've recorded 
uh, allowable deductions to look out for. But again, please look at your book. They go into more depth about these things. So first allowable deduction, your liabilities. You obviously cannot be taxed on money or other people. So what, what do we do? The same thing we did with our total assets. We go back to our liquidation account and we have a look. What is our total liabilities? We then put that down. As you can see, it's now coming in our negative column because we're minusing all of our liable deductions. So liabilities is the one thing. You'll see the next thing is a charitable bequest. So what they are saying is in your, if you have a will, and in your will, you say you leave money down to a, um, let's say for a charitable organization. Let's say you leave 100,000 rand to a children's fund um, for argument's sake. They're saying you're actually leaving money behind for charity. So whatever you're giving to charity or for a charitable cause, we will not um, tax you on. So we can minus that as an allowable deduction. All right. The thing over there is the life policy with surviving spouse is the named beneficiary. Now, this is something to look out for. Now, now, by deemed property, we plus a life policy that had a named beneficiary. So now, by allowable deduction, you see a life policy with a surviving spouse is the named beneficiary. Now, what are they actually telling you? Let's say you had a life policy, and the life policy is um, when I die, uh, the policy must pay out to my child X. Okay, to your child X, for argument's sake. We know that life policy would have had a home under deemed property because it's a life policy with a named beneficiary. As you look by allowable deductions, it says the life policy with a surviving spouse is the named beneficiary. My child X is not the surviving spouse, meaning I just plus my deemed property. So it had a very negative um, impact on my estate duty. Um, but what happens if the scenario was I have a life policy and my life policy I am giving when I die five million rand is to be paid out to my spouse, right? So to your wife or your husband, right? Oh, please, now, again, this is a life policy with a named beneficiary, so it has its home under deemed property. But if we look at allowable deductions, Sorry, Kyle, could you please we're surviving spouse of the name beneficiary. This policy, where I say when I die, five million must be paid to my surviving spouse. It is also an allowable deduction. So we plus it and we minus it. What are they actually saying? We will not punish you if you leave money through a life policy Sorry, for your surviving Kyle. spouse. Sorry, we plus it and we minus it. Kyle, hello. Your order is fluctuating. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Where, where, where did it start giving problems? You were explaining about a life policy with named beneficiary and the one uh, where it was called. Okay, yeah. Uh, all right, good stuff. Okay, so we're still busy with that. So let's, let's just recap. Let's just make sure we all mute it. So, if you appointed, uh, ladies and gents, some of us are not muted. Please mute your mic. There we go. Please mute your mic. Okay. I think we sorted. All right. So, let us say. Your life policy said, um, all right, when you die, you want to leave 5 million rand to your surviving spouse. Okay, we know it has a named beneficiary, so it was not in our liquidation account. So we're now with the state duty. Dean property said life policy with named beneficiary must be plus. Your life policy said when you die, it must go to your surviving spouse, 5 million rand. So we had to plus it by deemed property. But we also get to minus it by allowable deductions because allowable deduction says here, life policies where surviving spouse is the name beneficiary. 
So what are they actually saying to us? They are saying that we will not punish you if you have a life policy that you leave for your surviving spouse because we'll plus it and we'll minus it. But the moment you start leaving life policies to people who are not your surviving spouse, this is when we start having estate duty complications because some people leave life policies that are big, 10, 15, 20 million, things like that. And if you, if you had to leave it, imagine you left a 10 million life policy to your child. That's going to be plus by deemed property. It will not be minus as an allowable deduction because your child is not your surviving spouse, meaning you're going to be taxed on it. And it starts to impact your estate because this estate duty is getting minus from your assets together with liabilities. So it is something to consider going forward and keep that in mind when you do estate planning. You know, because you might end up drafting all and thinking people are going to inherit this or that. But when estate duty is done with you because of those life policies you left to people, you're not going to have much left ultimately. Okay. If you look at the next one, I said the accrual paid. If you recall by deemed property, we had accrual received where the surviving spouse owed us accrual. So we plussed it. Now, similarly, it could be the other way around. We could have a scenario where the deceased estate owes the surviving spouse accrual. So if I owe the surviving spouse accrual, if my deceased estate owes you accrual, I'll need to transfer that money or the executor must transfer that money from my deceased estate to my surviving spouse. And they're saying, well, you can't be taxed on that money. We can't because it's not yours. It's going to someone else. If you flip the page, look at that last, the last one I write there. Anything that goes to your surviving spouse as a result of the deceased death. This is a general rule. Anything that accrues to your surviving spouse when you pass away can be minus as an allowable deduction under estate duty. I've given you the example of the life policy already. I've given you the example of the accrual already. What about a marriage in community or property? Now, if we think about it, ladies and gents, we sit in the liquidation account. We put the full value of all the assets. So if there was a house for two million, we put a house for two million. And we carry on adding all of this to get our total assets. But now the question should be, but you know, if I'm married in community of property, why am I being taxed on the whole two million? I should only be taxed on half of it, right? This is where it comes in. So if you were married in community of property, Half of your assets, half of the value thereof, we need to record as an allowable deduction because your spouse owns half. You cannot be taxed on what on things that you don't own ultimately. So remember that as a valuable rule. If you see something that a spouse must receive because of your death, it is an allowable deduction. So ultimately, we sit with the scenario now in our estate duty where we had property plus deemed property, minus allowable deductions. We'll have, obviously have a figure. From there, we need to minus or less our Section 4A primary rebate. You'll see I put there 3.5 million. Please, in the exam, do not put 3.5 million the way I do it. Write it out in numbers. Okay, so property, my, uh, sorry, property plus deemed property, minus the allowable deductions, minus 3.5 million primary rebate is going to give us an answer. That answer we call a dutable amount. Ladies and gentlemen, there's obviously a great chance your answer is going to be a negative answer. If it is negative, the answer is null. If you get to null, never write zero or write the number zero. You write N-I-L. That's the way we do it in the States. But please, if you get to a null answer, do not stop your sum there. Finish your sum because you get marked on it. You say 20% of null equals a state duty. Obviously, 20% of null remains null, but we just complete our sum because we get marked all the way through. So that is the formula you need to apply when doing estate duty. I suggest you go and you study property, deem property, and allow deductions in your book. Look at the notes, get the proper understanding of it, study that, and then go to your book and further your knowledge as, su as such. But that is the formula we're looking at when dealing with estate duty. All right. Once I have this answer, just remember I had to go back to my liquidation account and fill the answer in there. Then I went assets minus liabilities minus estate duty.
gave me an answer, which is balance available for distribution. All right, let's open the floor for questions. I know Jonathan was first. Jonathan is no longer available. Can I speak? Oh, no, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, I don't okay. know how you know I'm not. Anyway, uh, Kyle, no, my, 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 my question was answered, but then as we're going, I want to know in terms of the accrual paid, you record it uh, in your estate duty calculations, but when, when the estate owes or has to pay an accrual over, where do you record that? So if an accrual needs to be paid over, it has its home under allowable deductions. If we receive for accrual, it has its home under deemed property. So accrual received, deemed property, accrual paid, allowable deduction. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Zach? I heard a, uh, sorry, I couldn't quite catch Zach. it, but uh, just before Zach, there was another lady. Okay. <clears throat> Yes, there we go. Go for it. Yes, I just wanted uh, you to just clarify for me uh, when how do we get to know after well, the 3.5? Just to repeat that for me, I didn't quite catch it. Okay, so, so look, I don't know what we get to because we're fabricating things here. But the sum in essence was we took our property value, we plus our deemed property value to that. Remember, property plus deemed property. From there, we minus our allowable deductions. And from there, we minus three and a half million. That three and a half million we minus, you must always minus a three and a half million. That's just the law. So you just study that. So property plus deemed property minus allowable deductions minus three and a half million gives us an answer. I mean, that answer might be 500,000 Rand. 20% of 500,000 Rand gives you estate duty. But, you know, there's a chance that your dutiable amount might be a negative answer, you know, if you're, especially if your state is smaller. If it's a negative answer, then we just get null because you can't have a negative answer in estate duty. And obviously then 20% of null equals estate duty. So yeah, when I said null now, now we're just speaking, you know, it wasn't an exact answer we got. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Uh, uh, yeah, Zach, it's here. Zach, sorry, sorry, yes, Zach was next. Thanks, Kyle. Zach, then Sue. Okay. okay. So, uh, Kyle, I have two questions which might not necessarily come out in the exams. However, it's just for my own knowledge. In the first, uh, the first question is: What if the deceased was a defendant in a lawsuit and he was being sued? So, say for example, the deceased was a doctor who's being sued for a claim in medical negligence, and obviously he passed on, and you, the lawyer, dealing with his estate. Would that be recorded at all in the liquid and distribution account? And if so, where would that be recorded? And the second question I have is you mentioned that uh, the under what's uh, uh, for the estate duty, anything that goes to your surviving spouse as a result of the deceased death. So if I were a director of a company together with my spouse and we are married in community of property, and if I were to then pass on automatically, would that company just automatically fall over to her? And would that have anything to do with my calculations in the estate duty uh, calculation in terms of my will? Thank you. Okay. Kai. Well, Zach, to answer the second part of your question, if half of those, um, if half of those shares is to your spouse, then remember your full shares would have been recorded in your liquidation account under assets. But if your spouse owned half of those shares, would have to minus that by allowable deductions because you can't be taxed on, on that figure. So yeah, her ownership over half will find its home under allowable deductions and estate duty. And Zach, I do want to mention, um, I have been up since four o'clock this morning, so my memory is not so great. So can you please repeat your first question? My first question, sorry, huh? it's, is that if the deceased was a defendant in a lawsuit, so my example was, say the deceased was a medical oh. doctor, Who's I remember being sued now, for medical negligence claim. Would that be recorded yes. in the LND? And if so, where? Thanks, Kyle. 
Okay, perfect, Zach. So, yeah, that is a problem, right? Eh? Because when you have running court cases, it means you can't finalize your L&D because the reality is you do not know if they are going to be successful with their claim. So your L&D gets placed on hold because if they are successful to the claim, they become a creditor. So they will fall under liabilities in your liquidation account. But we are unable to finish our L&D account because we don't know if they're going to be successful or not. Obviously, if they have a claim, it's going to hugely impact our liquidation distribution account. So we'll have to put it in hold, see if they are successful or not. And if they are successful, it'll be a, a creditor under your liabilities. Thanks, Kyle. Perfect. Sue, you are next. Uh, hi, Carl. My question is related to what uh, the last speaker asked, but I want to ask in a different way. Okay, we have a question uh, whereby the deceased and the surviving spouse were married in community of property. Then whilst we are recording in the liquidation account, we, we are awarding mostly on immovable and immovable property, right? Then we are leaving out uh, cash, the cash part. We are collecting and realizing on cash, but we are not sharing equally between the parties. So when I come to the uh, expenditure, the estate duty and dead, I'm sorry, before the distribution account, how do I know the total, um, the total amount which goes to the surviving spouse? Because I'm assuming that I can only take from the immovable and the movable, but the surviving spouse is entitled to share from the cash as well, which I did not award. All right. So, Sue, this is purely for illustration purposes. So, the fact that you didn't award it doesn't mean it's not going to go to them. The, the reason why we haven't awarded it at this stage is because, keep in mind, we need to still pay our liabilities and estate duty and things like that. And when we pay them, we can only pay in cash. So we don't award any of our cash at this stage to anyone because we need to keep it in hand to make sure we pay all those people who need to be paid in cash first. What's left, we'll sort out amongst the marriage and spouse and so forth. Because the reality is if you are a beneficiary, if you are heir, I can give you a car as an heir. But if I owe the bank money, I can't give them a car. I have to give them cash. That is why we don't award any of our cash at this stage because we keep it to see if we need it to pay our liabilities. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Bilal? All right, go for it. Um, I just want to hear something. You said with donations and the accrual claims that forms um, its deductible in the um, transfer duty. Does it come anywhere in the L&D? Like, let's say... In the factual question that you give us, you say, okay, someone has donated a million rand to the deceased. Um, do you only record that then in the transfer duty, nowhere else? Uh, in the estate duty under deemed yeah, property. Meet the, I mean the estate duty, yes. That's it, that's it. So you do nothing with it in the um, borders. What's the borders? The, um, yeah, yeah, look. Look, if someone donates a million uh, a million rand um, to your deceased estate, look, you would need to obviously, people normally donate money if they're shortfall. So it's usually to cover a specific purpose. I haven't come across a scenario where someone just randomly donates money into a deceased estate. It's always because there's a shortfall on something. So they donate X amount to make sure the estate can nicely balance out. But uh, if they had to just randomly donate a million rand into the deceased estate for whatever purpose, that's a different story. Because the thing is, the reality is I can't include that as an asset in my liquidation account. Because remember, assets already form part of my property. And then also go and include it in my deemed property. That would be an issue because I can't include a million rand and then plus a million rand again. So what I would do in such a scenario, if someone donated a million, um, I would record in my liquidation account that there was a million donation, all right, for those purposes, but I would plus it by deemed property and minus it by allowable deductions again so that it balances out. Otherwise, we're double taxing it, right? Because we've got to include it by, by deemed property. So if you ever come across a scenario where you are already have a figure included in your assets, but you had to add it to deemed property, you will understand you'll need to minus it again to balance it out to, to avoid any double taxing thereof. 
Perfect. Okay, I heard Katlejo, then I heard Sipu. So let's do it in that in that order. And then Naftali. All right, then you next. So yes. So we have the next three people. I think we'll do these three and then we'll move on again. Otherwise, we take too long. So these are the last three for this little question session. Go for it. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to ask if ever you are under investigation for maybe the murder of the deceased. Is it possible for you to get the letter of authority? Uh, uh, <coughs> I don't think you would get the letter of, <coughs> of authority. You would get the letter of authority if the master's office doesn't know you are under investigation. But if someone had to notify the master's office about it, they would not give you the letter of authority, no. But unfortunately, we do have situations like that because the reality is how does a master's office know you are under investigation for murdering someone? Someone will have to notify them. And if they are notified, um, th they won't put you in such a position. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Okay. Yes. Uh, what happens? What happens if, uh, as a deceased person, I won a, a case at the labor court, and I was awarded uh, a compensation of uh, eight hundred thousand? Where will where will that fall under this LNT? So if you, if you, as the deceased person, you obtain 800,000 rand for the deceased estate, is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. Before yes. I receive the money, uh, I okay. die. Okay. Yes. That, that will be a claim in favor. That's similar to John down the street who owes you 100,000 rand. So any, any monies that people owe you will fall together with banks and policies under claims in favor. Okay, thanks. Perfect. And I think the last one, I couldn't, I think it was Naptali or something yes. like that. Yes, no, that's correct. All um, right, go for it. I'm realizing that the uh, liquidations account are very technical. Now, what happens if the if family appoints me as an executor, even though I don't have this technical knowledge, and the master approves it, and I can't put together these accounts, how do I deal with that situation? Well, entirely, there is a way around it. You're just going to lose some money. So how it works is you entitled to 3.5% of the total assets for purposes of winding up this deceased estate. All right. That's the maximum you're entitled to. But let us say you could not do the L&D account. So now you come to, you go to another attorney or whoever it is that knows how to do it. And you say, listen, I want you to do this L&D account for me because I'm struggling with it. I'm entitled to three and a half percent. So what I'll do is, if you help me with the LMD account, I'll take two and a half percent, and I'll give you one percent for argument's sake. So you can sort of share your fees by bringing other professionals in. Okay. Okay. Thank Perfect. You. Okay. All right, ladies and gents, I want to just look at the distribution account tonight as well, and then tomorrow we can do the recap account and the income and expenditure. Um, but tonight, the plan is to do three of those five accounts. So let's move on to the distribution account. I mean, we have half an hour left. So we need to get cracking on it. Okay. So we now flip to the next page. And you'll see the distribution account. Ladies and gentlemen, these next three accounts, the distribution, recapitulation, and income expenditure, that's in no particular order. You can do these three accounts in in whatever order you like, okay? I just like doing my distribution account next. So what we need to, to understand is that these accounts sort of flow from one another. The one account survives to the other account. So we couldn't finish our liquidation account without doing our estate duty account. Once we got that, we went and filled it in in the liquidation account, and then we, we then got our balance available for distribution. This was a very key figure. This is the figure that all the people who are going to benefit from your death are interested in. Because if you look at your liquidation account, your balance available for distribution, that is the figure after you've covered all your liabilities and your estate duty. Meaning that balance available for distribution that's left, that is to be distributed in terms of marriage, in terms of possible legacies and in terms of heirs. Keeping in mind, if you die intestate, you cannot have a legacy. 
right? You can only have legatees if you have a will. So if you died into state, it will be distributed in terms of marriage and heirs. I mean, you could come across a scenario where a person dies intestate and was not married, obviously. So then I wouldn't have anything by marriage. I wouldn't have anything by legatees. I would just have heirs, ultimately. So interpret your exam question, okay? So if we have a look at the distribution account, it says, balance available for distribution brought forward. Make your notes if you think you're going to forget. That is your balance available for distribution from your liquidation account. So you carry your final answer from your liquidation account forward into this account. Let us say your assets minus liabilities minus estate duty was 2 million for argument's sake. I will then carry that 2 million into this account. Now I need to distribute that 2 million rand in terms of ranking. We know the ranking. Marriage, legacies, ends. So you can see underneath that, I said two surviving spouse. Now, ladies and gents, it's not automatic that your surviving spouse is going to get something. Look at the marriage regime. Are they married in community of property? Are they married out of community of property? If they're in community of property, they take half. If they're out of community of property, they take nothing. Um, you know, the accrual system might come into play as well. But the point is that, first of all, we distribute in terms of the marriage regime. And we give to that spouse. So let's say we're married in community of property for argument's sake. I would then have to give the spouse half of two million rand. So I'd give a million rand to the spouse. The rule is every time you give something away, you must just count how much you have left. So if I gave a million to the spouse, underneath it, you'll see I wrote their balance available for distribution. Two million minus a million means I have a million left. So I just we calculate the whole time how much money is left. So I've sorted the marriage out. When you're done with the marriage, next in line is legatees. Have a look in the, was there a will? Did it say give 100,000 rand to X? Did it say give 50,000 rand to this children's fund? The point is, whoever was supposed to receive something specifically given, they are next in line. We then go and give it away. Maybe for argument's sake, let's say, the will said give 200,000 rand to the children's fund. And that was our only legacy. So I'd put the children's fund as a legacy and I'd give them 200,000 rand. Now I have a million minus 200,000 rand, meaning my new balance of adult for distribution is 800,000 rand. After legacies, who's next? It's heirs. Have a look who are the heirs. If it's intestate law, do your calculations. If there's a will, the question will tell you who the deceased appointed as their heirs. I think in the example we ran off earlier, we just had one heir, was our child. So then I would name my child over there and give the child what is left. The point is the heirs share in what is left. So if we had, for argument's sake, 800,000 rand left, and we had one heir, they would take the full amount. But we could have possibly had four heirs, meaning the four of them would have shared in the 800,000 rand, 200k each. But the point is, when you're done giving away to the heirs, Again, you go balance and for distribution. You must end up with a null figure, meaning you must distribute that balance you brought forward completely in terms of marriage, legacies, and heirs until you have nothing left. So you can see the point of this account. This account is of no interest to your creditors, for argument's sake. But this account is of a lot of interest to your beneficiaries of your will or your beneficiaries of intestate law, or possibly your spouse if you were married in community or property. This is the account they'll be focusing on. Or your creditors will be focusing on your liquidation account because there they are mentioned. All right. So carry that balance from your liquidation forward. Give it away in ranking. We can't switch this ranking around. Okay? Spouse, legatees, heirs, take what's left. Finish with a null balance. That is our distribution account. And now I want us to have a picture of these three accounts now in front of us. And you can actually see these three accounts set out exactly who's getting what. It mentioned what the liabilities are getting. It mentioned what estate duty is getting. Whatever was left, the distribution account went and said what your spouse is getting, what your legacies are getting, what your heirs are getting. So together, these three accounts already paints the full picture over who's getting what. If you remember the, the steps we did in estate duty yesterday, I said, 
when uh, when you are done with your L and D account, you go and distribute the estate in terms of your L and D account. So what would you then do? You would look at your liquidation account and give to the creditors and all the liabilities and estate duty what your liquidation account says. The balance that left, you look at your distribution account, give to your spouse what they're entitled to, give to the legatees what they're entitled to, and give to the heirs what they're entitled to. All right, let's open the floor for questions on the distribution account. Naira here. Naira, go for it. Hi. Uh, I just want to clarify. Yeah, I just want to clarify some, something. So, when you have uh, in the distribution account for if there's a surviving spouse and it's marriage in community or property, then you're basically going to take half the amount of the total assets in your distribution account. Yes. No, no. So remember, you, what are you doing? You're carrying your balance available for distribution brought forward. So yes. you go to a liquidation account. You'll see there it's assets minus liabilities minus estate duty equal balance available for distribution. So that answer right at the bottom is what you carry forward into this account because that is what is left for your marriage, your legacies, and your heirs. But I'm talking about the surviving spouse after that. Say if it's in marriage and community or property, the amount to subtract after that. Um, would it be half of the total um, assets no. or half of the no. total distribution? There we go. It's half okay. of that balance available for distribution because remember, uh, that balance available for distribution uh, already factored in the payment of the liabilities, which your spouse was also responsible for if you had a marriage and community of property because it's a joint account. So therefore, that half that you give to the surviving spouse would be half of your balance available for distribution, not half of your assets. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. All right, see yes, Kyle. Kyle. Uh, yesterday you used a particular technical term. I can't remember it, but it relates to the balance available for distribution for the heads and legacies. What is it, by the way? Balance available the distribution. Of, yes, there's, there's a particular technical term that we have used. I think he's talking Something about like residue. A, oh, yes, residue. thank you. Yes, I residue implies what is left of the estate. That is for your heirs. So when we say residue, we say once we've given, once we've paid the liabilities and estate duty, that's what left. We give away in terms of marriage, and then we look at if there's any legacies. And then what's left after that, we call the residue. That is what the heirs, the heirs share. They share in the remainder. That's your residue. Okay, thanks. The next question, if the marriage was out of community of property, is my yes. spouse not entitled to receive 50% or should I state that in my will, how much she can get from my estate? So, so if the marriage is just out of community of property, Completely out. Yes, no. The spouse would be entitled yes. to nothing in terms of the marriage. So then I would skip the 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 spouse part, and I would start with legatees. Then you know. So worry about that uh, giving to your spouse half only if there's a marriage in community of property. Okay, that's it. So, so you would see, see, you would see from this distribution account. There's three possible types of people that can inherit, eh? marriage, legacies, and heirs. But marriage yes. might fall away if there's no marriage in community of property. Legacies might fall away if there's no legacies. So you might have a distribution account that only contains heirs, but you know you might have the other things as well. That's why the rank is important. So if you have a marriage in COP, you have legacies and you have heirs, if you have all of them, at least you know what order to place them in. But it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have legacies or spouse. Okay, thanks. Perfect. Hi, Kyle. Mafadi here. Good morning, sir. Got you. Go for it. Hey, Kyle, uh, I got distracted when you were talking about the balance available for distribution brought forward. Wh which one is that? That is your, if you look at your liquidation account, right at the bottom, you'll see balance available for distribution. That was your assets okay. minus liabilities minus estate duty. So that answer right at the bottom of your liquidation account. 
you're carrying forward into your distribution account. Okay, okay, thanks. Hi, hey, Carl. It's Roddy. Go for it, Roddy. Uh, so just, just, uh, I just wanted to, uh, based on what the other gentleman asked, uh, in terms of actually, uh, my way doesn't have a, doesn't have a will. Uh, now, let's say, for example, uh, the deceased is staying with a partner and they both bought a, bought a house. So the house is both their names, but then they are interstate. So how is this going to uh, devolve? So in such a scenario, then, um, then we've got to remember by our um, heirs then, or by the legatees, um, or if it's interstate by your heirs, you will need to add it, you'll need to mention the half share of the property and give that to the spouse because remember the spouse is the um no 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 i'm talking nonsense roddy hold on i'll confuse myself so keep in mind if you are out of community of property and you die intestate half of the value of that property is the other person's all right so we can't speak about their half value because it's got nothing to do with us we were not married in community of property Okay, so my half value of the property will be distributed in terms of interstate law. Whoever I have in my, in, uh, whoever qualifies in terms of my um, um, family tree, as such. So, so what I'm trying correct, to do, would I be sorry? Would I be correct to say that when you're on a liquidation account, so like let's say for example your immovable property, the home is worth five hundred thousand, you're only going to record two hundred and fifty, which is part of this estate. Not the other half of the person which is not married. Would I be correct to say that? You would be 100% correct, Roddy, because the reality is you don't own the other half of the house. Hey? Um, that's correct, yes. That's 100% correct. But remember, if it was a marriage in community of property, you would have still reflected the full amount because you guys had one joint estate. That's right. There Only actually not uh, interstate, then basically just the half is recorded. That's it. In, in that scenario you presented, you are 100% correct. All right. Thank you. Perfect. Carl, it's Cecilia. Go for it. Uh, just a quick one regarding life policies. Uh, in a case where the deceased only has a life policy in his estate and it has a named beneficiary, which is not the spouse, uh, does estate duty still get charged on that uh, life policy? Yes, yes. So you wouldn't have property, but you would have deemed property, eh? So yeah, it's that you would still come into play. Thank you. Yeah, Siboniso. Go for it, Siboniso. Sorry, just just to before I, before I take your question, I just want us to think about that that previous uh, question uh, from uh, uh, Fatima. So if you look at that scenario, that person just had a life policy payable to someone who's not their spouse. So they got hit under estate duty for that, right? So it makes us actually think, if I wanted to leave um, inheritances for my spouse and my kids, it might be wiser to take out a life policy and let that be paid over to my spouse. Let that be my spouse's inheritance, because I know I won't be hit on estate duty on that because it gets plus and minus, and maybe leave the assets in my estate for my kids. That might be a more smarter way of distributing your estate instead of leaving assets for your spouse and leaving life policies for your kids. Because that scenario is obviously going to hurt you in terms of estate duty. That's just a bit of food for thought. All right, let's hear your next question. Hi, Carl. So you can Go for it. Okay, so mine, it's, 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 it's a bit related to the previous question. And uh, we said that on the distribution, if uh, the marriage is not in community of property, which is uh, moved straight to legates, uh, legatees and, and, and heirs. But then now um, I, I'm saying um, they, it, it, uh, there is no will. So if there is no will, uh, do we go back to to to, to the... I mean, to the formula used for 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 a surviving spouse, which is um, uh, a greater of two hundred and fifty thousand, do we do we use that formula to to distribute? Hundred percent correct. Hundred percent correct. You'll do your interstate law calculation 
in terms of what we learned last night, okay, those rules we followed. So you'd have to calculate that. And then obviously your distribution account might have a, a, a half to surviving spouse if there was a marriage, but you wouldn't have legacies, but you would have heirs. And the heirs would be determined in accordance with your interstate law calculation, the rules we looked at yesterday. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Jonathan? Jonathan, go. Uh, for exam purposes, if we are, if we reach the distribution account in terms of interstate, now you say there won't be any legacies, obviously, but for exam purposes, do we still have to show it? Or we don't no. show it? No, no, you don't need to show it. I mean, you, you, you won't get marked for showing it. And uh, in reality, we don't show things we don't add. So no, you wouldn't need to show it. Thank you. Percy? Percy, go for it. Thanks, Carl. Uh, just a clarity in terms of the, the the balance that is going to be distributed, the residue. Does it mean that if, like in your example, you mentioned one million, so that one million, is it only the cash component or does it include the movable and immovable assets? So if it includes the immovable asset, let me say there is a property worth 600,000 then how will you distribute that? I just need clarity. I'm, I'm stuck there. No, 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 no. It's, it's a valid question. And this is the issues we we also come across when winding up an estate. That is why winding up an estate is not just a six-month job because there's a lot of other things that need to happen. So, I mean, that million rand for the heirs, we do not know. That could be cash. That could be a house and cars. It could be a house plus cash. It's, it's a mixture of whatever, you know, there is. You know, so the reality is if you had four heirs, for argument's sake, that had to share in that million rand, they would be 250 each. But let's say there was immovable property to the value of 600,000 rand there. It probably would come down to us, us having to sell that immovable property so that we can give the parties 250,000 rand each. It depends on your heirs. I mean, they, they might come to another agreement where the one person says, listen, you know, I will, I want to take the house. Uh, I will pay you out your guy's share from my own pocket because I want to keep the house. That's also an option. But you've got to speak to your heirs about it and say, look, you must each get 250, but we have a 600K property here and maybe only 400K cash. So I can't realistically give everyone 250. How do you want to do it? Do you two want to put the property in your name and you pay the difference over to those people? Or should we sell the property and split the money between you? So it's a question you'd have to pose to the heirs. Let them tell you, I mean, at the end of the day, if they can't reach agreement, what are you going to do? You're going to sell the property and divide the cash. Thanks, Kai. Perfect. Misty. Hi, Okay, I heard two ladies there. I think Misty was first. Have I got it correct? Yes. Hi, Kyle. I just have two questions. So my first one is regarding a question that was asked earlier about co-ownership. So if a property is co-owned between two people who are not married, in the liquidation account, we would put half the, the value of the property, so the part that the deceased owns. How do we explain that in the, in the divestment note about why the property's full value is not listed in the liquidation account? No, you, you would have to then mention half ownership as such. Okay, so you so would I make a note here. That's it. Yeah. Okay. And then my second question is, um, in terms of the distribution account, we go surviving spouse, legatees, and then heirs. If the surviving spouse, can a surviving spouse also be a legatee? Like if something specific outside of the in-community property is left to them, is that possible? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, the surviving spouse could be all three possibly. I mean, you could have a will. You could be married in community of property. And you could have a will where you say the surviving spouse must take the house and then I nominate the surviving spouse as my child as is. Then mm -hmm. your surviving spouse took half on top, took the value of the house by legatees and then was one of the two heirs at the bottom. So, yeah, you, you can appear in more than one place, which okay. is often the case. OK, so you would you would um, put the spouse's name under all three or under whichever ones they appear. You would just put them That's separately. That's it. And whilst I've got the opportunity, I think something I can say that's quite important. Um, when you when you name someone, so let's say we named our surviving spouse, there's a certain way we do it. We we mention name, surname, 
ID number and relationship to the deceased. So let's say it was the surviving spouse's name was Mary Jane, for argument's sake. I would have said, to Mary Jane, ID number so, 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 surviving spouse of deceased. If it was my child, to Mary Jane, ID number so, and so, surviving daughter of deceased. So, yeah, that just reminded me perhaps of something I should mention. When we mention someone, name, surname, ID number, and what was their relationship to the deceased person. Okay, great. Thanks, Carl. Perfect. Mayna. Go for it, ma'am. Um, I'd like to take you back to our previous lessons whereby a certain um, individual here asked you about a polygamous marriage. Name? Yes. You yes, yes. Something about the first marriage being uh, in community of property and then the next one or the following ones being out of community of property. So is the out of community of property with or with uh, with or without Accra? That's my first question. And then my second question will be, in a scenario whereby a guy or a groom is marrying two women at once, because I've seen it happening. So how are they going to, like, what's the, what's the status there? Uh, I, uh, is it determined that, um, the first one, I mean, is it going to be determined? To, is it going, are you guys, oh, how am I supposed to put this question? <laughs> well, um, well, let me, maybe I can save you from it. Um, uh, so let's do it this way. First of all, to answer your first part, it is out of community of property, um, completely out, okay, no accrual involved. Um, mm -hmm. to, for the second part, I can see where you're going with it. But I can tell you okay. from the back of it that, that I, 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 I have never dealt with a matter like that. So you speaking of what happens if someone marries two people at the same time, who's the yes. one that's going to be in community of property? Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, Ma'am, you know, I, I don't know. Like, I, I've never encountered such a thing. I know that the rule state clearly doesn't matter what type of law you're following. You cannot be married in COP to more than one person. Um, I would assume that you can't marry two people at the same time. But if people are, are doing this, then you, you must in some other way have recorded by home affairs who gets what. Because how do you, I mean, if the law says both are um, can't be in COP, how do you determine who is in COP? Um, you know, that flabbergasts me. And, you know, I, I could try and give you an answer of what I think, but I would prefer not to give answers on things I'm not 100% sure of. Because maybe you hold me to it and I'm wrong. You know, so I, I can tell you that that's a, a situation I've personally never encountered. And if a person sat before me at my office and posed that question, my answer would be, let me get back to you. Because I, I really don't have an answer for you on that, eh? Okay. No, it's fine. But I'll keep my mic on you, hey? Hi, Carl. Okay. Hi, Carl. Hi, Go for it, go for it, go for it. Okay, um, I wanted to add on what I think her name is Mina just asked regarding two spouses. Yes, it's my so I think it was in the law of succession that we learned. Um, if you get married to more than one spouse, even if it's in customary law, um, I think it's in terms of section 7.6. I stand to be corrected, but you have to go and register the customary marriage. And then you have to stipulate which, um, um, how do you say this, like which regime would um, regulate the marriage. So basically the first marriage would be in community of property and then the second marriage would be out of community of property. And that would basically resolve the issue when it comes to um, the estate devolving. So it goes back to our law that we learned in LLB and that would resolve that issue. So, no, so, I, I, so man, that just, just to jump in there, um, th that is the way everything should be done. And, you know, as we say, you should register at home affairs because you almost, you set up an estate plan, you know, so that's ideal. But I, I think the biggest challenge we're having at the moment is that wouldn't be an issue if it was registered. But we have a yeah. lot of customary law marriages that are not registered. And, you know, the question then would be, how do we deal with two people getting married at the same time to a person and we don't go and register at home affairs? You know, that, that's a bit of a different, 
a kettle of fish. I'm not too sure how I would deal with that scenario if it has not been registered. Because the rules, if you look at case law in the past, it doesn't say that if you have not registered it, it is invalid. It can mm. still be valid, you know, through proving it in the court. Um, so that would be quite an interesting scenario to see how that got dealt with. I don't know if you, if you perhaps have experienced something like that before. Um, I haven't heard it before. Oh. I've seen it happening before, hence I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I get that, but I don't know if anyone knows what the answer would be to that question. That that's more what I'm I'm asking over here because I myself uh, am unsure about it. Hi, Carl, it's Roddy. Yes, sorry to bother you again. Uh, in terms of the uh, plus deem property, that there's there's tax donations. If donation received. Will, have, uh, will it be actually basically under liability or will it be a plus? So, so that will be a plus, but, you know, donations is one of those things I, I'm too, uh, I'm a bit scared to just say it's this or it's that, because you must look at the context in which the donation is because being made. You have donation, sorry, you have donation payable and donation received. Like the other gentleman was stating about uh, you get a million rand or something of the sort, as donation. So if, uh, basically, if donation payable, then it will go under, it will believe it, you, to, you won't be able to, to, you will go into your asset, yes, but then you can deduct it again and our label deduction, am I correct? Yes, but remember, it was also plus in our deemed property. So as a matter of a fact, it, it didn't play um, any impact in our state duty, but we just had to show it as a plus and a minus. And the purposes of that is, uh, Look, if the donation form part of your um, uh, liquidation account, it means that it already forms part of your total assets in your estate duty, meaning that it already forms part of your property in your estate duty. But the rule says we have to plus it by deemed property as well, because I think our first deemed property or second one was donations. That's donations, you know, received as such. Um, uh, <sighs> I think that I think I'm explaining this in a very difficult manner. If you receive a donation, okay, mm -hmm. that was by our assets in our liquidation account. But if you, if the deceased estate, if you left in your will, for argument's sake, that a certain donation you are making to someone, that donation um, would be formed under a deemed property. But in terms of donations received, you're quite right to say that it's an asset in the liquidation account as such. Okay, thank you. Hi, Kyle. Hi, okay, Kyle. All right, listen, ladies and gents, we're already sitting on half past eight. I heard, I think it was a, a SIPU or, Sepan, or Sepan, Sepan, Sepan. something like that. Sepan. So, so, so we'll just do the last one for tonight. Uh, okay, there was a lady as well. I'm going to feel bad if I don't give you a chance. So the two of you will be the last two questions for the evening. If you miss out tonight, please record your questions and ask me tomorrow night. So let's do these last uh, two final questions. Okay, my question is regarding the distribution account. Maybe I missed something, but under the surviving spouse, doesn't the 250 rule apply? Uh, if it's interstate law. Or if it's, all right, okay. Thank That's you. it, yes. Perfect. All right, then there was the, the, the lady as well. Hi, Kyle. It's uh, Masuda here. Um, my question is actually, actually about wills. So what I wanted to know in terms of South African law, how does an Islamic will fit into that? It fits in the exact same fashion as customary uh, law fits in. Provision is made oh. for it and it can be applied in the same manner. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Ladies and gents, it's half past eight. It is time for us to bid each other a farewell. Um, if you missed out on a question, keep it in mind, tomorrow is another night. At least tomorrow when we start at 5.30, what we can do is we can have a look at those final two accounts. And then in the second session uh, tomorrow evening, we can have a look at the, there's a question paper I put forward as well. That's sort of a question paper I just drafted. And what we'll do is we'll look at our notes that we've looked at today and see how we would fit those questions in 
um, into our notes. In other words, how would we go about drafting that as such? All right, ladies and gentlemen, have a fantastic evening. See you all tomorrow evening. Thank you, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Carl. Bye. Good night, everyone. See you tomorrow. Thank you, Carl. Bye. 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 Draw Kyle.